Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Diane Poole Heller, PhD. Diane is an internationally recognized speaker, author, and expert in the field of child and adult attachment theory, as well as trauma resolution. Her expertise in trauma healing have benefited survivors and families of 9-11 and the Columbine shootings, and her work with adult attachment has formed a path for adults with childhood attachment injuries to develop secure attachment skills, SAS, that lead to more connected and fulfilling adult relationships. In 2019, she was awarded a Lifetime Humanitarian Award by the Association for Spiritual, Ethical, and Religious Values in Counseling. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Living 4D. Today, I'm super excited to dive into attachment styles and relationships with the amazing, highly skilled and gifted therapist, Diane Poole Heller. When I first started learning about child parent attachment styles and the challenges of insecure attachment styles from now famous psychiatrist Dan Siegel, MD, I was not only very intrigued, but could easily see the evidence he shared right in front of me, not only in my own personal life and that of my siblings, but in my clinical practice. I could also better understand why it is that people with other attachment styles can be challenging for me to engage with, but understanding what's actually going on makes it much easier to be empathetic, compassionate, and be a catalyst for mutual healing and growth with people that challenge us. I studied other authors on attachment theory, such as Dan Brown, and worked with the research to formulate my own attachment survey so I could be aware of how a client's attachment style may relate to challenges that they're experiencing and how my awareness of their attachment style may require that I modify and engage them as a therapist or coach in different ways. I found through my investigation of the people that I was supporting as both a therapist and a coach that their attachment styles often clashed with their partner's attachment styles, which made it much easier for me to offer effective joint relationship coaching. Before I dive into sharing our guest for today, I'd like to give you some context for this interview right up front so you'll know that this podcast is very important to you. Secure attachment is classified by children who show some distress when their caregiver leaves but are able to compose themselves knowing that their caregiver will return. John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworthy developed the theory known as attachment theory today after inadvertently studying children who were patients in a hospital at which they were both working. Attachment theory explains how the parent-child relationship emerges and provides influence on subsequent behaviors and relationships. Stemming from this theory, there are four main types of attachment. Secure attachment, ambivalent attachment, avoidant attachment, and disorganized attachment. There are unique characteristics, tendencies, and behaviors about each of the insecure attachment styles that help us both understand why we are the way we are and why we have a hard time in relationships with others. Often others we love, but paradoxically who tend to drive us batty if we're exposed to them for too long. Honestly, I can't even begin to imagine what percentages of committed relationships and marriages end that wouldn't have ended if people and couples understood the information on attachment styles that my guest, Diane Poole Heller, shares today. Though I had reached a functional level of understanding of attachment styles and how to work with people to help them heal their attachment wounds so they can enjoy a secure attachment within themselves and their relationships, I was researching to find a good resource to share with my patients, clients, and athletes that was clear, practical, digestible, and applicable. The best program I was able to find in my research was created by Diane Poole Heller, a very experienced, wise trauma healing specialist and expert at attachment styles and how to heal them. That program is an audio program titled Healing Your Attachment Wounds, How to Create Deep and Lasting Intimate Relationships. It's an absolutely excellent program. It's not only a highly applicable educational program that applies to most all of us, It's what inspired me to interview Diane Poole Heller, and I'm very grateful that she responded with a willingness to share today. In this deeply interesting interview, Diane Poole Heller shares how it is that she got so interested in trauma healing and attachment theory, and why it's an important part of her work as a therapist and educator. Diane overviews the four attachment styles and gives us excellent tips on the characteristics of each of the insecure attachment styles, making it easy for us to recognize which attachment style we have. She shares a lot about how people with differing attachment styles can work towards secure attachment together. Even though I've studied attachment theory quite a lot, I found the information Diane shared to be very important and potentially life-changing, not to mention that it could help you become aware of why you've had the kinds of challenges that you've had in your personal and professional relationships. I hope you enjoy my dialogue on attachment styles and relationships with Diane Poole Heller. 
Oh, just one more thing. Before we get started, I need your help. I want this to be the best podcast possible, and that means I need your feedback. To do that, I've created a short survey. Please fill it out by going to checkinstitute.com forward slash survey. That's C-H-E-K institute.com forward slash survey. Beyond helping me improve the podcast, when you complete the survey, you'll also be entered to win a bundle of all sorts of cool gifts from our sponsors. The survey will start today and end on January the 10th. On the 10th, I'll draw one name at random from our survey participants to win the sponsor bundle. So please take a moment to make your voice heard. Your opinion is important to me, and the sponsor bundle is pretty cool too, so don't miss out on that either. My dream is to make the podcast something exciting and special for you each week, so I look forward to hearing from each and every one of you, and thank you in advance for your participation. And finally, thank you for your willingness to learn, grow, and love more with me each day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. I'm very excited today. I have a guest I've been wanting to share with you for quite some time, and we finally managed to arrange it, and that's Diane Poole-Heller. And I have been aware of her work for a very long time, and I was absolutely, totally impressed with her audio audio CD program from Sounds True called Healing Your Attachment Wounds which I highly, highly recommend, and I'm sure you'll know why within about a few minutes of listening to her. And Diane's work is linked, as I'm sure she'll share, with Peter Levine's work. And Peter Levine's someone who used to eat lunch in the same restaurant that I did very often, so I used to have lunch and have chats with him now and then, and I've studied a lot of his work. And I've been sharing Diane's work as well as uh, Dr. Dan Siegel's and Dan Brown's work on attachment with my students for quite some time. But uh, Diane, I'd like to just start by saying, having studied a, a fair bit of attachment um, styles and, and theory and things like that, I found your presentation in your healing attachment wounds to be probably the most digestible and relatable of all of them out there, which is why I chose to seek you out, not some of the other experts on attachment. So thank you for sharing that amazing piece of work with the world and all the other things you do. Well, thank you so much. We try to make everything (laughs) user-friendly. That's a good idea. (laughs) Yes, yes. Let's make it so it's relatable. I I totally agree with that. That's In fact, that's what attachment's about, being relatable. Yeah. In my experience, most of the great therapists of the world, like the shaman of the world, generally come in through the school of hard knocks. They're faced with their own riddles, which, if solved, provides them with an authentic basis for their work in the world. And I know from listening to interviews with you that you, too, have had some pretty significant uh, bumps in the road of life. Could we start with you sharing an overview of your life path, your education, and what ultimately led you into being involved in trauma and attachment work? Oh my goodness. Yes, of course. Um, let's see. I, st- I started out as a child. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's good. Better that um, way. <laughs> um, basically, uh, you know, a, a middle-class family in Pennsylvania and uh, lovely people, but with some definite stressors there, you know, some mental illness, some um, violence here and there, but a loving family, but also a traumatic experience exposure as well. So a lot of soul searching on trying to understand what was uh, necessary suffering and unnecessary suffering when I was little. This was a question I held, which was an odd question for a little kid. But I would like observe my mother when she was freaking out and I go, okay, that's unnecessary suffering. And then I, you know, bump into other, you know, real suffering that wasn't just generated by personality or impatience. So I was having, I was holding this question coming in. I think if everybody's listening, thinks about it, there's probably a question that, or a few that you've sort of been focused on, even as a little kid that is kind of guides your inquiry into the human journey. And that was definitely one of mine. I was also trying to understand as a little kid, man's inhumanity to man. I was kind of a heavy kid, heavy in the sense of, you know, willing to enter the darkness. I was always watching movies on, I don't know, women's prison movies and World War II movies. And nobody in my family was interested in any of that stuff. And I don't know why I was. I think it came in with me, you know, it was a funny orientation. But then in terms of hard knocks, I, you know, I had three uh, 
over the course of my lifetime, three near-death experiences. So those have been actually really difficult, but also very informative. I mean, in terms of being able to meet people in dark places and hold a large container for healing. As I recovered from each of those, um, I just learned so much. It, 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 after the fact, <laughs> it led to a lot of uh, post-traumatic growth and insight. So I, in a way, in a weird way, sort of grateful and also that they aren't easy to recover from. One was from a very, very violent attack when I was 11 years old. One was a car accident in 1988 that I kind of smashed the windshield with my head. It was a head-on collision. That was a really serious one. H- head injury, brain injury, all of that to have to manage and move through. And then more recently, about mm, eight, nine years ago, I had a surgery that went bad. It w- they thought they lost me on the table. Then I had to have immediately a second surgery to repair the mess that they made of the first surgery. And they thought they lost me then. And then and then I got sepsis. And then I got, I just, they did every a lot of things uh, incorrectly. That case basically put me in a semi-coma to try to see if they could reset my body. So I, I really, that was the one that I remember the most of the death experience. I was pretty far out there. Um, but interesting. I mean, it was really um, hard because it took me about six or seven years to get, um even 75% of my energy back and, you know, because they, and I'm not going too much detail, but anyway, they did, they made a lot of mistakes in both surgeries and the nurses at the hospital kept saying, my God, they're just trying to take you out. And I'm like, yeah, it sort of seems like that. But it's weird to have to surrender when you don't really trust the medical care you're getting, you know, I mean, and you have to surrender in surgery. And then of course they make all these mistakes. So it was not intentional, of course, but a big thing for me to recover. So those, those are some things that have informed my work and um, my understanding of the human journey and the, and actually the indomitable spirit that we eventually can tap into that really helps support our healing, that return to vitality and, um, clarity and light, you know, and radiance, all these things that are available to us, even when we don't see it or can't connect to it because we're in that constriction or the pinch of a traumatic event, which is no small thing. I'm not at all trying to make light of that because I think really understanding trauma and dealing with trauma is a huge life task. And many people don't decide to go that direction. They just just stay in the constriction, which is understandable because it can be painful. But my life's been kind of committed to figuring out how do we hang out with somebody in a way that allows them to just bit by bit uh, integrate what happened and also not having to get too heavy into content where we're just really looking at how we can tap into that life force and vitality and um, well-being that is there alongside any other really difficult experience and and at the same time honoring the difficulty of the experience. Yes. You know, in shamanism, the great shamans say usually when you're destined to be a shaman, you're going to go through a very challenging life path that's going to produce a lot of pain and often injury. But the shamans say that all the energy that's bound up in the wounds, once healed, is freed so that we can use that energy to access higher dimensions and help other people find and center themselves. So I think my own life has taught me there's a lot of truth in that. And it sounds to me like you've had plenty of winding and unwinding to really have a, a depth and breadth of experience to to really be a, a great mother uh, archetype for a lot of people. Well, I do think we learn along the way a relationship to suffering. And sometimes when I bump into something that really constricts me into a blind spot, I, I go, okay, I'm on to something. I don't, I can't see it right now and I'm in the pain of it and it's really painful, but I know I'm excavating something that needs to be understood. And it just helps me hang in there and try to stay connected and let the pain be the guide for a while until I can see, get to the other side. But it's, it's, you know, it's so important, I think, for us to give ourselves support or have access to support, whether it's shamans or therapists or friends or colleagues or sometimes even strangers that can help us tolerate what needs to be metabolized and also not to dive head into it in a way that overwhelms us to where we just disconnect into like a shock state or something. So there is a lot of help these days. I mean, when I think about my parents' generation, they, you know, therapy, I'm 67 almost, you know, so 
I'm older probably than many people listening, but you know, in my day and age, parents, we just didn't even have therapy when my parents were my age. So they didn't have that as a resource. They had religion and faith and, you know, other community support in a way a lot more than it seems to be available in our culture today. But um, they had different resources. But it we are lucky to have the explosion of information on how the brain works and how healing happens and all these therapy models that are out there. It's a very rich time when you decide to jump into the healing perspective. There's a lot. Uh, oh, my gosh, it's overwhelming, really, how much knowledge there is now. But we are very, very fortunate to have access to that. Well, your descriptions of both pain and access to spirit remind me of something that Jung once said. Someone asked him. How do you know when you're in the presence of God? And he said, when people irritate me. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I, I think most people misunderstood him. But but what he was really saying is that people have this con conception of God as only good things. But he, he was saying that when God irritates when when he's being irritated by people, he has to realize that that's also part of the process of oneness and, and life and growth, and you can't run from it or you never really find out the truth of anything. That's a really good point. Fritz Perls used to say, like somebody would say, oh, I, you know, I had this horrible thing happen. And he'd say, congratulations. And then he'd say, they'd say something, oh, I heard this really happy thing happen. I just got married to the love of my life. And he'd go, oh, too bad for you. And it was really <laughs> the opposite response that you would expect, you know, but when you think about it, it's like the, the growth, but we, you know, we do. And sometimes I think, unfortunately, we do learn so much from what we get tangled up in if, if we're just willing to keep paying attention. But sometimes, I mean, I just had one that I had for that like four months, I was in this hole and just struggling kind of, what is it? I can't, I can't pop, you know, I can't pop the, the blind spot. Like what, I just kept cycling into this pain. And eventually it, eventually it shifted. It does eventually. And I realized that it, I was experiencing, someone had, had hurt me a lot. They had, in a way, I had, was a, kind of big betrayal in one of my closest relationships. And uh, I just kept cycling around it, you know, and I kept thinking, okay, all this he said, she said stuff is not helpful. And, <laughs> and then eventually I saw that it was the wound of self-love. I realized that my family wasn't particularly loving in the, the way you would think families ideally would be. And um, I realized that I had this hole around self-love. And then I started just waking up with this love, this experience of love. So it was worth it eventually. I, I wouldn't have said that two months in, but eventually I was like, okay, I, I need to work on this. This is great. And so now the self-love is so accessible, but it was hidden under a big pile of pain for a while. Yes. I teach my students that when pain appears, it's the pain teacher. So always acknowledge your pain and challenges as the pain teacher. And to the degree that you become present, listen, and respond according to what is actually an honest effort to resolve it as opposed to drug, medicate, or ignore, then the pain teacher goes away when you engage the pain. But as long as you keep circumventing or making excuses or drugging and not really engaging it, then the pain teacher just keeps turning up the volume. <laughs> I'll say very wise words. That's a very, very wise uh, relationship. You know, Gurdjieff, and I'm probably butchering this, but when I was reading him, the spiritual teacher back during World War II days, lovely and amazing person. I've studied him. Um, I know who he is. Yeah, he's incredible. Uh, but he said, he, and I'm not, this is an exact quote, but what I got out of what I read about five pages from him, it said something like, um, we have the most spiritual growth in the worst times in history you know like and he was he was working in world war ii he was like doing the soup kitchen in paris and the nazi in, invasion of paris he didn't leave he's stayed in the world war ii environment which was very challenging and um but i think that's interesting and i always say why do you think it would be that we have the most spiritual expansion in the times of history that are the most challenging and I don't know his answer for that, but my answer for that is, is as we learn the right relationship to suffering, all that constriction, if you think of like a slinky compressed, you know, all that energy, you said this earlier, is there. And then as we begin to, we can use that same horrible traumatic energy to fuel our expansion and transformation, but we have to do it in a way that doesn't overwhelm us and disconnect us. So we have to find a relationship to suffering that allows us to integrate along the way and don't try to take too big a, big a piece of it at once, you know? But I thought he was very masterful at uh, and, uh, 
explaining that. And I that has been something I really live by as well and talk a lot about in my trainings, of course. When it comes to easy access, potent nutrition that is minimally processed, I get all excited about Organifi's excellent products. Organifi offers you a comprehensive line of certified organic superfoods from excellent drink mixes to protein powder to probiotics to excellent collagen supplementation for your skin and connective tissues to liver, joint, and immune support nutrition. My family and I and my clients and students use Organifi products every day and I've never heard anything but great feedback. They're easy to prepare, highly nutritious, taste great, and travel well to work meetings, the park, sporting events, or school. And you get 20% off as a Living 4D podcast listener when you go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, and use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's CHECK20, all caps, So if you use that code on checkout, you can get 20% off on any of their amazing products. I truly do love them. My family loves them. And I'm quite confident you will too. I think it would be helpful to lay the foundation for our discussion if you could describe what an attachment style is and then explain each of the four commonly recognized attachment styles. And when I was listening to your program, which I think I've been through three times now, oh, wow. um, I thought, well, you know, I, um, I, I take my study as a, a practice that I have to embody before I can effectively teach it. And B, I feel that if I just listen or read something, but don't really engage it, then it just becomes intellectual knowledge. And as Jung said, intellectualism is a common cover-up for fear of direct experience, and I don't want to uh-huh. be one of those people. Well, very good point. I, I take a lot of trainings, too. I love I love learning. There's so much to learn. It's so rich. I thought your explanation, I, I was going to say, I thought your explanation of the percentage of people that were secure in their attachment was really interesting. So as you explain each of the styles, could you also, if you have the stats, tell us approximately what percent of the insecure attachments uh, like h- how many of them are avoidant or ambivalent or disorganized, for example. I just think that'd be interesting for people to know if you have those numbers. Well, you know, when you do a Google search on those numbers, it changes all the time because they do all these different research studies uh, with different groups, college kids, you know, uh, uh, back in the 50s, it was usually one per- parent working, which is not normally our situation now so much. And uh, so they were only interviewing women. They weren't interviewing men because men were at work in the 50s. You know, that was when a lot of that research happened. And so you need to, when you look at research, I think it's really important to qualify it a little bit. Like, for instance, if I would do research on the indigenous peoples that, like of Canada and United States and Australia and Mexico and other places in the world that were like, in our culture and Canadian culture and Australian culture, where all the Indian children were taken away at early ages and put into very abusive residential schools and, you know, used for experimentation. You take, if you test a population like that, you're going to have almost a hundred percent or a very large percent of disorganized attachment because you have threat mixed in with the attachment system. So what, what's happening that's a little bit concerning right now from the original research, I I mean, I can quote statistics from the original research, but now it's a bit dated. So is that secure attachment is losing ground, which is not a good thing. Uh, It used to be about 51% of the population they felt would would, uh, show up as securely attached. And I'm going to explain what all these are. So I'm giving you statistics before I explain the styles, but let me say a little bit about this. Um, And then avoidant was maybe, you know, roughly 20%, 25%, and ambivalent was roughly 20 to 25%. And depending on which study you look at, then they didn't even used to uh, do research on disorganized because it's very hard to track that. It's, it's a, doesn't have a predictable pattern, but you can see it because kids will show a fear response that's coupled and inter- interwoven with their um, need to attach. So that's not so hard to spot, but usually they would say five to 10%. But the thing is, if, like I said, if you were focused on the indigenous populations that suffered so much for generation after generation after generation, or you think about slavery for generation after generation after generation, or genocide in many cultures, I mean, I'm talking about this really heavy stuff, but it's, that's going to, 
it's so dependent on which group you're looking at. That's that's what I mean about really understanding how these statistics may or may not be relevant and cultural yeah, well, differences. I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Into it. yeah, no problem. I, 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 I think you know, just sort of having a sense of how do the cards lay out, um, and you know, if it's around fifty percent secure, then we know half of the people that you're going to have a relationship with are probably going to be, um, vis- there's going to be visits from the pain teacher. You got to learn how to work through it, or you're going to have, uh, you know, a lot of problems. And I think you probably saw in my outline, I have some questions that point in that direction, but, uh, maybe you can just go ahead and share some of the, uh, qualities, the names and, and the qualities of each of the attachment styles. Okay. The most important thing is to really get a handle on what is secure attachment, because mostly if you just go, you know, talk to somebody informally, they usually think, well, hey, I had three meals a day. I mean, if they're lucky enough to have that, right? But three meals a day, trips to the doctor, my parents, you know, made sure I went to school, you know, that kind of thing. I had a roof over my head. I mean, some people don't even have these basics, but that is actually just the barest minimum of what it takes to have secure attachment. Secure attachment has a lot more to do with your parents being able to be present and attuned to you as a child, uh, and they also attune to your internal state so they understand. So basically, it's a lot more than the three meals a day and roof over your head. It has a lot more to do with how a parent is present with you, attuned to you, they get you, they take the time to get you if they're not understanding you. Um, uh, children feel like they're understood. Uh, they feel safe. Parents put a lot of energy into creating um, safety. And even within their relationships, like the parent is concerned about not harming the child and they're kind of teaching a kid how to be self-protective, but also the child can relax in this energy of safety. And and the parents are relating to each other that way. They they aren't saying harmful things to each other. They're not threatening divorce or threatening, you know, to hit somebody or they're not threatening to leave if somebody doesn't agree with them, but they're actually like able to resolve conflicts. They have conflicts, of course, but they're able to resolve them in a way that's um effective. And kids see that they're kind of like little sponges for the relational field, including their relationship with mom and dad, but also mom and dad's relationship with each other or mom and mom or dad and dad, however the couple is. So um, it doesn't matter from an attachment point of view at all, what gender we identify with as a parent uh, in a, in a relationship or if we're single or whatever, all of these things apply into what we like to call mothering presence. I think it's Bonnie Badenoch that said that mothering presence could be your nanny, it could be your older sibling, it could be your dad, it could be your grandparent, it could be an aunt and uncle, it's anybody who's really in that caretaking role. So one of the things that communicates safety the most is prosody, how you use your voice. If somebody has a very flat, non-melodic, robotic kind of sounding voice, and some people do, that actually signals threat into the amygdala. We are evolutionarily designed to use our voices as a threat signal, but we have to make sure we're not doing that when we're parenting or when we're in a conflict with our partner, because it'll put people into their fight, flight, or freeze mode just automatically due to tone of voice. Um, When women get scared or they're they want to signal the tribe that there's a threat say back in caveman days cave woman days there was a tiger coming in i don't know or a tyrannosaurus or whatever uh to the mm-hmm. camp their voices immediately would get very shrill and very high <laughs> very high huh. and <laughs> so that was evolutionarily a smart thing because as soon as they heard a voice go that high that everybody in the tribe knew oh, okay something's wrong Let's look around. What's going on? We got to fix this. So that's an actually productive thing. When men get scared, their their voices get low and they boom, they get loud, they're kind of booming. So immediately the tribe would know, okay, trouble, but they would get that signal from a guy. Now, what you'll notice in relationships or when parents get frustrated with the kids, they need to pay attention to what their voice is doing. Because as soon as, if I'm a woman, my voice goes high or if I'm a guy and I start booming and get loud... I'm going to put my kid into, or my partner, into a threat response. And that's not the part of the brain that is relationally oriented. It's like just trying to survive the next five minutes. So um, if, if you can trigger a fight just by shifting your voice, because the person, your partner goes into fight mode, and they, then you're in a fight, off and running, and you're not in the social engagement prefrontal cortex part of the brain that cares about whether the relationship continues or not. So these are just basic skills. I try to give people really practical things they can do to return to security attachment. So I'm just saying a little bit 
more about that. Of course, touch is really important. That's really tough with the pandemic right now because people are, you know, touch is a little scary uh, with the pandemic spreading so much, at least in the United States. It's like really going out of control here in Colorado. I think it's everywhere in the United States. So safe, affectionate touch when that's possible. Uh, obviously, it is really a big attachment bonding glue of having uh, skin to skin contact and cuddling your kids on, you know, each other. And if you're in that kind of relate, you know, spousal relationship, eye gaze is really important. And you know what? It doesn't cost a thing. You can be at a party, probably not these days, but you can be at some socially distanced gathering and just shoot your partner a look across the room. Say they're talking to somebody, you know, all the way on the other side. Just shoot them a I love you or you're special to me beam gleam, I call this. And you can try this with your dog at home. I mean, it's like everybody responds to this you're I special even do to it me. With my talk. plants. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I haven't thought about that, but that's a really good idea. Um, <laughs> so so you're sending out a certain energy. And these are things that support the attachment bond. And there's all these things that we do sometimes unconsciously that don't support it. So we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But I want to talk about some of these positive things because just, you know, whoever's listening, just have an intention to shoot beam gleams. I do it with strangers and you just be amazed at the response you get from most people. It's really so easy and doesn't cost you a thing. And it just puts some good energy out there. And gosh, we need it these days. Playfulness is a big one. Making sure you have enough playtime. We are a working, and I would say overworking, culture because we're very focused on productivity, efficiency, you know, making stuff happen. And all that's lovely. We have a strength in our country about that, but we sort of overplay our ace and we have to make sure we're having play dates with ourselves or with uh, our partners or with our kids or with our friends. Just do anything you can to increase your play quotient because that is also very, very supportive of the attachment bond and laughing, expansive joy, telling jokes. I mean, you know, singing, all the things are really, really helpful. We want to, as a partner or a parent or therapist, of course, we want to practice having sort of an ability to contain whatever arises in a child's experience. And some parents are really good with certain emotions and maybe not so great with other emotions. Usually their emotions they are uncomfortable with or their parents were uncomfortable with and they disown them. So some parents are really great with holding joy and happiness and maybe even sadness or illness or things like that, but they're not so good at holding anger or they're not so good at holding, um, you know, a lot of dysregulation. Other people may be really shut down when there's a lot of expansive joy because they weren't allowed to be super expansive and joyful that somehow triggered a wound in their parents. And so they shut down their kids when the kids are really in expansive joy. So whatever emotional state you're not that comfortable with, and sometimes your partners or people around you know that better than you because you're usually disconnected from it and kind of disown it. Um, you want to see if you can bring in an ability to be okay with that emotion. It gives you more bandwidth and then you can be attuned and connected to your a relational environment uh, in those less comfortable states uh, because they eventually get comfortable as you get used to it. The Another thing that's really important and indicative of secure attachment is how do you as a couple or as a parent and a child or as friends do your comings and goings? If you're living with someone do you have a going to bed ritual? Do you have, because you kind of separate into sleep eventually, right? So I have a friend and I always tell the story because I love it. She and her husband, they're just a delightful couple, a very loving couple. And um, they have their challenges like everybody else, but they have this tradition. They both love really good gourmet chocolate. I have to say, I'm, I love that too. Um, but they will, back when you could go shopping a lot, they would go out and they'd get these really special uh, truffles at these special places. And then every night they would put a different truffle on each other's pillow and they would just eat, slowly, slowly savor this truffle together. And they would debrief their day and just clean up anything that might've been a little bit of a snag or a little misattunement or something. And then even if they didn't go to sleep at the same time, because I think one was a night owl and one wasn't, they would end their day that way. And then they had a morning ritual around breakfast in the morning. So how do you do comings and goings? That can even be like if, if somebody's going out to work during the pandemic, they come home. When you're the one at home, do you just continue washing the dishes or helping the kids with the homework? Or do you stop what you're doing and just say, I'm going to turn the stove off and I'm going to, I'll be back 
to the kids to help you with your homework, but I'm going to take a moment. And you just would greet your partner and hug them. And I would say a body to body hug, not a triangle hug, where you're just hugging around no. the shoulders. But not it, a if it's hug. safe. Yeah, exactly. Not if it's safe. I mean, with the pandemic, all these things have to be tailored a little bit. But if you feel like the person in your house is also a really safe person, then you can um, do this full body hug and you stay in the hug till both bodies are regulating each other. So you can feel the nervous system move into co-regulation. And let's say your partner has a sore lower back. You put your hand there to soothe that and say the other person has a headache and the so the, op, the partner that doesn't have the headache would put their hand on the person's head to give them some healing support. So people, anybody's body, anybody with a body and a nervous system, right, which is most of us, right, <laughs> there loves to be around another body or energy of a person that's regulating. So can you think about all these ways you can be a regulating factor at work, at, at home, with your kids, with your spouse, all these different ways that you can have uh, regulation. And then we, of course, need to learn to self-regulate and self-soothe. That's part of secure attachment, as well as really learning to co-regulate. So you want to have reunion rituals and comings and going rituals. Those really, really support um, secure attachment. Stan Tatkin, uh, who I love, he's a friend and a colleague, he uh, uh, created the PACT Institute with his wife, Tracy Boldham and Stan Tatkin. And they have a little YouTube you can look at called the Welcome Home Hug. So just practicing that can do wonders. I did. I just did that exercise with a couple that was loved each other, but having a really hard time. And I had them in a training, go through the coming home ritual and that changed their relationship in a really major way. So it can be it can be somewhat simple. It doesn't have to be so complicated. That's that's what I love about really understanding attachment uh, ther theory and repairing when there's a misattunement or, you know, of course, we're going to like make a mistake or be late or, you know, screw up on something or be a little abrupt because we're stressed or the pandemic anxiety gets to us and we get a little bit more snarky. You want to notice that. And then as soon as you can do it, <laughs> as soon as you can do a repair attempt. Just go, you know what? I can tell I was impatient this morning. I was a little stressed and I, I think it came out and I, was, I kind of bit your head off about the dishwasher or something. Can you, uh, I, just, I just want to mention that and I apologize. Repairing again is free, but when I interview people in my workshops, only about 10% of these are therapists that are doing a lot of personal growth in my workshops say that they had any good modeling from their parents around repair. So repair, if you don't do anything else from listening to this podcast, see if there's somebody that you need to repair with and make that attempt or or let yourself be available for their repair attempt if they're trying to repair with you, even if they don't do it perfectly. Even your dog will try to repair with you. They get into the garbage and make a mess in the kitchen and you walk in, they'll their head goes low and they kind of, their tails wagging low and they'll come up to you like, oh, I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't have that. You know, just let the repair happen. It makes a really big difference. And the other thing about secure attachment is there's an easy flow between um, being connected and also being alone. You're not stressed in either direction. So that's where we're trying to get back to. And we're trying to, like, I call them secure attachment skills, develop practices that help us go in that direction from all of the insecure attachment styles. So I'll let you have, have a minute for questions or comments, and then I will, um, I will tell you a little bit more about insecure attachment. Sure. I do have a question. Today, we have uh, probably the highest number of single parent families ever. And I'm curious, how much of an impact is that on uh, creating secure attachment? Well, secure attachment is, is you can have very high quality secure attachment with one parent. Um, and it, it helps, I think, for parents to have the support of having a partner when that's available and, um, and to be able to co-regulate together because it's a big job to most likely they're working as well as trying to parent. And now with the pandemic, a lot of kids are home on Zoom. I mean, it's, it's just a lot, you know. So to see if you can, as an adult, have somewhat of a, a support system, maybe it's another single parent that has a similar age kid or something where you can have um, or older relatives that are available. It, it really helps to have a support system. Um, but certainly you can develop secure attachment uh, really with anybody that's in that role. I mean, sometimes it's a grandparent that's the more secure attachment, primary attachment uh, person, you know. But that uh, was the case for, for me, for sure. Yeah. And my it, grandmother was, was the savior. 
Oh, good. I had a savior grandma too. I, I had a wonderful grandma in my, in my upbringing. So that helped a lot. Definitely helped a lot. And even if you are not the person that's the primary parent, like, but you're in the person's life and you're there, maybe not as frequently, being securely attached will be a huge benefit to that child that may be dealing with complicated uh, dynamics at home. And if you can't change them, I mean, sometimes we're not in a power position where we can affect a change, even though we'd like to, you know, but, um, being that person and letting a kid know that people like that exist and they can have that safe relationship with all the qualities I just described makes a giant impact on people. It's a huge gift if you are able to be that person in the world. Hi, you guys. I know you all know that super green powders are good for you if they're made from organic sources and they're processed properly so the nutrients are there. And that's exactly what Paleo Valley does with their super greens powder. So I brought Autumn Smith in to tell us exactly how she created it and why and what it's going to do for you when you try their amazing organic super greens powder. Autumn, what is the magic you've got here? Well, like you said, we all need to get more of those micronutrients that you find in fresh fruits and vegetables. And so we've created a powder that you do not have to choke down. It has an absolutely delicious berry lemonade flavor. And the reason that it's different is because A, it is all organic, 23 organic superfood ingredients. And B, it is a very, very gut-friendly product because what I've found in my practice is that a lot of people don't do well with cereal grasses. And we know cereal grasses, like wheatgrass, can contain lectins that can be hard on the guts of a lot of people I work with. And so what we did was we created a a cereal grass-free alternative. We use high quality, the cleanest, highest quality spirulina on the market raised in India. And then we added the 22 other organic fresh fruits and vegetables and the flavor will surprise you. So all you have to do to check it out is go ahead to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase c-h-e-k-15, at checkout. My son drinks it every day. We call it his ninja juice, and I sincerely hope your family loves it as much as ours does. All right, everybody. Go paleo green and get rocking. Hope you love it. As I mentioned to you before we started, I have two wives, and when I look at how my kids, I have a 41-year-old son, and then I have a four-year-old, four-and-a-half-year-old boy and a one-and-a-half-year-old girl. And just seeing how much more love and support they get with two mothers is mind-blowing because it's really much more like a tribal-type upbringing where there was kind of everybody was your mother, everybody was your uncle, and there was a lot more um, support for, for parents, both males and females. But I, I'm watching day by day as my kids grow and, you know, if their birth mother, Angie, is stressed, then Penny steps in and, and they get lots of love and support. And there's, it, it's very rare that of the three of us, all three of us are in a state of stress or detachment within ourselves. So I've found it just to be a miraculous thing. And, and both of my kids are just so healthy and so happy and uh, it just it also when when the kids are being challenging because there's three of us, each of us has different temperaments. So if Mon is, you know, going off and throwing a truck across the room or something and I don't really have the space in me to deal with that empathetically, inevitably one of us is much more grounded. It's rare that three of us are all in a state of stress at the same time. So just you know, as a therapist myself, I've been doing this work for 36 years, so I have seen a lot of things. I see that what's happening for them is is really special from an attachment perspective. Sounds good. Yeah, it's, it's helpful to have regulated uh, regulated parents available for sure, and they can help each other as well as the kids have somebody to go to. That's a safe haven at any given time. That the more that we can provide that, whatever our family structure is, is is really really helpful. So, would you like me to go into a little bit about in, insecure attachment at this point? Yeah, sure. You know, I I remember uh, my studies. And really, I personally identified with the ambivalent from my upbringing, which was very, very intense. My uh, my, my father drowned when I was eight. Oh, my, I'm so sorry. Yeah, my mother and father had, my father took off 
when I was probably three and a half. And then my mother married a man that was intensely violent and oh, uh, very, oh. very vi multiple hospital visits and oh. things like that. So um, when I listened to your program and studied it thoroughly, I kept really finding myself in the ambivalent um, because I really had to sort of get away to get safe. So I spent a lot of time outside of the house and away from the house because I always felt walking in the door was like walking into a very unstable environment. Like I, you never knew what the hell was going to go down in there. So um, I think everybody, as they listen to these insecure attachments is going to have no problem going, uh Oh, there I am. <laughs> well, it, it's true they, because this relates to every human being walking around. It, it, we often do hear some of our own story in them. And of course you can have a mix of attachment styles because, you know, your first father could have been with you one way and you're, you know, if you, if parents have divorced or split up or there's been a death, whoever's been a major role in your life, um, your attachment system is flexible. It will shift re depending on the person that you're relating to. And of course, we have a default attachment uh, profile. Was like when we're sick or we're stressed or things are really difficult, we tend to default to that major uh, way we deal with attachment. We have an attachment quiz on our website that you can take anytime you want. We're revising it right now. It needs some corrections. So forgive us for the the, uh, <laughs> the time it's going to take us a couple months to correct it. But um, we, we also have a good like 10 questions that I would guess if I remember right about 10 on each of the styles in your audio program that I mentioned, which I thought right. were very helpful. Right. And I also have a book since the auto, I did the audio program called The Power of Attachment and the questionnaires, all that information is in that too. It's just a book you can get on Amazon. It's easy to get. I'll, I'll but, have to um, get just, that. Yeah. Just to give it easy resource if you don't have a time to put it in a CD player, you know, and all of that. Um, that it's an easy, handy resource. But uh, on the website, it's just dianepoolheller.com and you can go on that and it'll also give you an overview. You get kind of a pie chart. Of, it looks like you're answering questions where you're getting, you know, 20% avoidant, you know, 35% of ambivalent and, you know, whatever the other number is for secure. It just gives you a little bit more specific feedback. But when somebody, let's talk about avoidant, and I'm going to be focusing on parenting caregiving styles in the time we have today, because um, <clears throat> you can also have these attachment adaptations towards insecure that happened because maybe there was an early medical procedure or there was birth trauma that didn't have anything to do with your parents' parenting skills, or they got sick when you were one and a half and they had to go be, be in the hospital for three weeks. And you didn't understand that as a little 18 month year old, um, that you missed your mom or you missed your dad. So different things can influence besides just parenting styles. So I want to acknowledge that it can be the temperament of the child. It can be medical procedures. So, but I'm only going to talk about parenting right now because that's uh in the time we have will be i think most useful to people well, I, I think what you just said is is very helpful uh i don't remember you mentioning that in your audio program but i think that's really really helpful because i think if a parent's listening to this and they're doing their best to um parent in a way that conforms to what you've described as secure attachment but their child is showing insecure attachment i think it can be helpful for them to know maybe it's not me. Maybe there's something that's unresolved in my child. Right. And the, the, what, where, wherever it is, it, whether it's medical procedures, you can do work through that, you know, and eventually the attachment uh, situation will come back. One thing I, you're reminding me to say is from all the way back to John Bowlby, who understood attachment as part of our inherent biology. We come born with an orientation to secure attachment. It is a fundamental evolutionary instinct because, it, you know, when we're born as babies, we're very dependent. I mean, some critters, some species that, you know, a colt is born and they're running in the next few hours. You know, it's not, we're not like that. So we are highly dependent as little ones. And so we have to have an attachment need to con stay connected to our loving, hopefully loving adults, because they're a safe haven. If we're in danger, or we're hungry, we need fat or we need sleep, whatever. Um, we need that parent there to regulate us and to feed us and to protect us. So the attachment system is very strong in the human being. And if you, I like to think about it like, like this, like you have an inherent secure attachment. You are designed for secure attachment. Now, if 
things go wrong and you're not born in a pro-social family, you're born in a danger zone, you are going to adapt to that uh, evolutionarily also. And so, but if you think about it, like you've got secure attachment in you and then some, all this stuff can be dumped on top of it, like wounds and betrayals or lack of trust or, you know, um, violence, like you mentioned, all that can be dumped on top of it, but it, it is there and it will start to surface when if in therapy, the therapist creates a safe enough environment, or you marry somebody that's securely attached, or you, you know, connect with somebody who's securely attached. They say, if you, pick a securely attached partner, it, the research shows that it takes about two to four years for your insecure attachment to shift to secure. Now, one of the reasons that works is because if you're with a secure partner, they're always reflecting whatever's going on in a secure way. And they're not blaming you. They're not shaming you. They're, they're not hitting you. They're not, they're not doing all these other things that may have happened in your family of origin. And eventually your secure attachment goes, Hey, this is, this is good. I, I can, my secure attachment system can come up, can show up. And it gets a lot of reinforcement if you're, cause you're living with the person usually, I mean, or you're with them a lot. So that influence is very, very strong. And hopefully therapists have learned enough to move to their own secure attachment as a base because they're also deeply in influencing people to move in that direction. It's a big invitation for clients or people or friends or colleagues to move towards secure attachment if you are very solidly grounded in secure attachment yourself as a human being or in your role as a therapist or your role as a partner or parent. So this is a worthwhile healing because it affects every relationship in your life. And you and once you have access to secure attachment, you have that for yourself for the rest of your life. It gives you all sorts of resilience against post-traumatic stress. Even if you experience a trauma like I did with my surgery or my car accident or whatever, um, you have a lot of resiliency that comes from um, learning secure attachment along the way. Many of us didn't hit the jackpot and start out with it, but if you did, y- you probably don't even know you have it because you just take it for granted, but y- you should listen to this and be very appreciative. I do want to say to all the parents listening, because probably most of the people uh, have some kind of parenting experience uh, with them too, that just take all that pressure off your shoulders. Really just let all those concerns drop. Because I'm going to be talking about some things that parents might have struggles with in a minute. But as soon as you start to learn secure attachment, you can reinforce and repair most of your relationships if you kind of went sideways on something. The the attachment system is very forgiving eventually when you start to practice secure attachment skills. And and being honest about it and and asking for a repair or initiating a, an apology, all of these things can be very, very powerful. So the secure attachment system wants to go back to secure, and that's true of your kids and partners if we can pr- make some practices that allow that to happen. So let's talk about avoidant insecure attachment adaptation. I tend to call these attachment adaptations because you're basically adapting to the deficits of your caregiver. A child has no choice but to adapt to what their parent is able to do or not able to do. And, um, and then later, that creates a relationship blueprint that very often gets passed down through the generations. This is an intergenerational challenge. And we learn to parent from how our parents parented. And then sometimes we have a lot of work to do to rearrange that. Or sometimes they parented really well and we have the benefit of knowing how to do that. So that's really good. Um, You you know, uh, if I could interject there, Jung says all children are tasked with the unfinished business of their parents' lives. And I think that that's exactly what you're describing. Yes. And then they collect some of their own unfinished business along the way, too. So it's a big job. pass it on to their kids. (laughs) Well, hopefully, the, the, the great thing is, is, is as you heal back towards secure attachment, at least, uh, you know, with some major parts of it, then you are not then destined to pass on uh, insecure attachment or, or attachment injury onto your children. And that's one of the biggest gifts you could give someone. And it's a big, big, big gift to do that healing for yourself, but it's really a huge gift for all the generations that follow. It just gives people so much more um, right brain, left brain integration. Uh, there, it, con- it connects you to your natural compassion and love. It connects you to a, a sense of we're all in this together versus uh, the idea of us versus them. It, it's not a polarizing orientation uh, that we struggle with in our culture today. It 
there's so many things that heal. I mean, I really feel like the fastest way to heal generationally would be if everybody could really commit to learning secure attachment from world leaders on down because it mitigates so many of the problems that we keep bumping into that are so egregious. But anyway, <laughs> obviously, I'm, I'm all for that. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, this, I'm, I just think it's a very healing focus. So, and it's a great metaphor in a way to, to healing into your more spiritual nature, obviously. Um, but in avoidant, in avoidant attachment, um, usually the relational environment is such that the parents are absent. Um, they just don't have presence. And so a baby looks out into the world and they see a parent that's basically not there. That's very scary. Even though the parent may not be doing anything scary, they're actually, their lack of presence is terrifying because if you're hundred percent dependent on them, you need them to be there, you know, be physically actually present. And sometimes uh, uh, the parent, one or both parents might have a very negative rejecting kind of perspective act at way that they treat the child. And sometimes a child will adapt to avoid if the parent's actually present, but they're only present for left brain activities. They're only present when they're teaching the child something like how to ride a bike or how to read or, you know, how to do art or how to speak English or how to speak another language or how to, um, whatever, you know, uh, math or science projects or whatever it might be, they're only show up and are enthusiastic or present during a left brain activity. And one of the things that happens in avoidant adaptation is we get very strong reinforcement for the left brain and almost no reinforcement or connection to the right brain where emotion lives and where relationship orientation is. So very often what happens is the child's naturally going to reach out for connection, but what they're confronted with is absence, uh, neglect, uh, rejection or just task focus. And so they start to revert to a, a premature, I call it reactive autonomy, where they become very self-oriented. Like I can do it myself. I can't have my needs because nobody's there to fulfill them. So I either don't have needs or I just do, if I have a need, I make sure I do it myself. I'm no way I'm going to ask somebody else because my experience is they don't do it well or they don't show up. Um, they often experience a lack of emotion because they weren't reflected emotionally. Their parent wasn't aware of their emotional states themselves. So there's nobody that's going, oh, honey, I see you're sad. Yeah, your friend didn't come to school today because they're sick and you're missing them. And yeah, I get it. That's sad. You really miss them. There's nobody doing that. Uh, so it's almost like they get the message that emotion is not really part of the picture. And because they're mostly living in the left brain, they don't have access to emotion. So that's a big part of the healing is to start to allow emotions and also not get freaked out when other people are having emotions, your child or your partner or your colleagues or, your, or a stranger, that you can enter into emotional territory without feeling completely overwhelmed and dysregulated. And that's a challenge and something we can help a lot with in our partnerships and our parenting and in our uh, therapy with other peoples to help them gradually, slowly tolerate in the beginning emotional states um, in a way that's really helpful. Very often they, they internally and avoidantly adapted person. Now you can have a little of this or a lot of this, but I'm just going to get talking about it. Like it's a box right now, just so you get the idea. Um, they can be uh, kind of feeling, they sort of sometimes feel really superior too. Like, okay, I don't need anything or I take care of all my own needs. So why are you needing this for me? And they can invalidate their partner's very natural needs in a relationship that they have a right to need, you know, like wanting to snuggle or wanting to cook dinner together or, you know, wanting to, I don't know, get support around financial stuff or whatever it is. Um, sometimes an avoidant will feel when you're around them, they'll feel like they're not receptive to um, anybody's needs because they learned early, early, early before they even had time to, th to have a story about it, that that needs were a negative thing. But need is a good four letter word. <laughs> it's a good four letter word. They need to tolerate their own needs and then also be responsive to the people around them that have needs. Because of course, as humans, we have independence, but we also have dependence and we need to have dependence as much as independence. It's a little imbalanced in our culture towards independence uh, because we're, the truth is all of us as human beings are interdependent and you need both things. You need your capacity for uh, autonomy and independence, but you also need a capacity to depend and to ask for support and get help when you need it. And we are interdependent. You need both of those. And we underemphasize in our culture um, 
the the fact that we do have needs and it's okay to have needs. It's not a bad thing, you know, it's a good thing. Um, yeah, so so another thing with avoidance is they tend to have a low word quota. They often tell stories in a way that they give you so few details you don't really quite understand it. And they often, the stories are without any emotional nuance. It's like, okay, I sat in my first grade class, the third row from the back, uh, and my teacher was Mrs. Smith, but I don't have any feeling or memory of what it felt like to be there because the memory actually happens the way memory is encoded in the brain is through emotional context. So you might remember something factual, but you can't remember how it felt to actually inhabit that memory. If, if you're coming mostly from left brain. Now the, everybody, all these attachment adaptations have a huge gift and the huge gift of the avoidant is they don't get distracted by relational complexities at work or whatever. They get the job done. They are really great at taking something on and being productive and getting the job done. And of course we need that. It's often celebrated in our culture, but uh, I have a bigger vision for people that are struggling with avoidant is that they can also have enriching and yummy relationships as well. And so we're just trying to, in each of these attachment styles that are insecure, we're trying to bring people back so they have more and, the, and they learn, some, they can learn some of the behaviors that help that happen. You know, Bioptimizers makes an amazing product called P3OM, which is a prebiotic product. And it's amazing for uh, not only helping uh, repopulate the gut with uh, friendly bacteria, but as Wade will tell you, it's really, really an amazing uh, product in case you ever feel like you're getting any kind of food poisoning or illness coming on. And Wade's right here with me, and he's the co-founder of Bioptimizers, and he knows more about P3OM than anybody. But I can tell you this, I've had nothing but excellent results and nothing but positive feedback from all my clients and friends that I've turned, it on, turned on to P3OM. So Wade, tell us a little bit about P3OM and, and why it works so well. Well, P3M is, we call it the Navy SEAL of probiotics. Amen. Basically, basically, its job is to kick out the bad guys in your body. Uh, food poisoning is one of those things from bad bacteria. What we've done is we've taken a, an aggressive strain of L. plantarum. We put it into toxic soup, ran a sine wave to keep a few of them alive. And the few survivors, we grow on very specialized medium to make a cultured, patented enzyme that has extraordinary powers uh, number one, it survives the intestinal tract. Yes. And number two, it is absolutely hunts down uh, pathogens in, this, in the body, bacteria, viruses, these type of things. And this is really where the future of probiotics is. It is about developing and culturing and creating super strains of probiotic, very much like the Navy SEALs go through a training and these yes. individuals mm -hmm. have extraordinary powers to deal with chaos. And in today's world where we want to improve our immunity and our function and our gut health, P3M is head and shoulders above any probiotic out there. So my understanding is it can be used daily as a supplement, but it can also be used in larger quantities as a defense measure. We've tested this uh, literally with over a hundred of our friends who have been suffering from various times of food poisoning. And a handful of those guys when you're in food poisoning and within 20 to 30 minutes, you complete recovery. That's awesome. And I've, I've uh, seen it happen myself. Angie has felt bad a number of times and uh, several of people in the, in the house or family have. And I say, take 10. If that doesn't feel good in an hour, take 20. And you've told me you can't overdose on them, which is amazing. Yeah, that's the beauty of P3M. You can't take too much. They'll fight off the bad guys and uh, they'll get your digestion rocking and rolling the way it should. So if you want to have a healthy gut and you want some defense, carry P3OM with you wherever you go, airplanes, cars, business meetings, hotels, conferences, and you've got your Navy SEALs in the bottle and they're ready for you anytime. Wade, how do we, we get a hold of your amazing P3OM product? Super easy. Just go to www.bioptimizers.com slash living4d and put in Paul10 for your 10% discount code. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S.com slash living4d and Paul10 for your discount code. You got it. There you go. Try it. You'll love it. I use them. I can't tell you enough how much I love this product. I think it's a genius product. And you've heard it right from the master himself. Get your P3OM. Let us know how you feel about it. Lots of love.
a couple of things that rose up. One was, you know, needs are really sort of the axis of relationship. If we didn't have needs, we really wouldn't have much impetus to be in relationship. I think, you know, our one of our primary needs is is love. And, and which is, you know, I define love as the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self or other. And mm, so beautiful. if we if we don't have a need, then we don't have this flow of energy and information or empathic and compassionate connection. And people that have a hard time loving others tend to have a hard time loving themselves as well. So I think um, for an avoidant, you know, because I, I am very much the avoidant type and, and through, you know, 41 years of collected 41 years of marriage in total now, I've had to really learn to allow myself to a respect others needs and and honor the fact that what some people find as an important need may may seem to me like <laughs> you know really you need that or you're upset about that or you're you know you're emotional about that uh, because simply because I was raised on a farm where the only need was to get the work done. And if you didn't get it done, you get the hell beat out of you. So you just sort of had to, uh, the only real need was to protect yourself. And the only way you could do that was to be highly productive and then get on with it. You know, my father used to say, if you're not bleeding or dying, shut the hell up and get busy. <laughs> and that's. Yeah. Yeah. That's brutal. You know, the thing that I want to point out is all of these attachment adaptations are wired into our survival system. So a, a child doesn't just decide, you know what, I'm going to be avoidant. <laughs> it's not like that. They are reacting to very real circumstances like you just so beautifully but brutally described uh, that was your original circumstances. And, and when you develop a relationship template, first of all, it's unconscious. It lives in implicit memory. And you have an it's integrated into your survival system so to be alone or to work on your own or to not be so relational feels like survival it feels like if i move towards intimacy i'm going to die i mean it's it and it's and it i really want to make sure that people hear that if someone tilts a bit towards avoidant adaptation an avoidant person has that secure attachment system right underneath that might be a big wound like you were describing their secure attachment system is there like anybody else. Because one of my pet peeves is that some authors that write about attachment talk about avoidance as if they don't want connection. They want connection. They just feel that it's dangerous because it was originally. And and even when they're trying to love you, say you're a partner with an avoidant, they're trying to love you. They actually think that by being distant or giving you a lot of space is what's loving because that was the way they had to adapt to a parent, you know? So they have to learn. I mean, if you're an avoidant listening to this, because I have some avoidant myself, if you're avoidant listening to this, um, one of the things that I try to give people really practical practices, like if your partner, of course, if not avoidant, maybe, usually you don't get two avoidance together because there's not enough glue, but it can happen very rarely. But uh, when if you're avoidant, one of the things you need to practice is can you lean in and like touch your partner's arm if pandemically that's safe and just say, I want to be here. I know you're upset. I know you're feeling this sadness. You just lost your mother or your dog or whatever. I, I know you're really having a hard time and I want to be here for you. And, and, but you know what? The emotion is a little overwhelming and I know you need to feel these really strong, deep sadness and grief feelings. And I, but I, I can be, I, I'm getting a little overwhelmed. Would you be okay if I walk the dog for 15 minutes and I'll be back and I will be here for you? So you kind of have to do what you can do. And if your partner knows that you're avoiding and they know that their emotion overwhelms you, they can even say, honey, I am in grief right now. I'm having a lot of emotional response and I know this is hard for you. Why don't you take a break and walk the dog for 15 minutes and then come back? And I'd really love it if you could listen to me about this issue or about this loss or about the situation. So you, if you understand your own attachment system compassionately and you understand your partner or your kid or your colleagues, your partner's um, ad adaptations, you, you know how to support them to take a break into what they need to do from the, the insecure attachment 
but you can give them some things that will really help. Like if I'm ambivalent, I'm going to have talked about that one yet, but I need a lot of reassurance. So the avoidant person can learn. It's a learning. Uh, like, the, why do you need reassurance? You know, instead of saying that, you can say, honey, you're my gal or you're my guy or you're my, you're my kid, you're my special kid. Or, you know, you can give reassurance. Like you are so important to me and you're really an important part of this household. And I just want you to know how much I deeply love you and appreciate you. That is like gold to the ambivalent, you know? So then their attachment system relaxes. The, the avoidance attachment system is basically wired to shut down like turn off. Like, so that's why they don't feel that relational. That does not mean, I really want to underscore this. <laughs> that does not mean they don't want connection. They want connection like anybody else, but their adaptation is to move away from it. And like, if they get really close, like they have this really intimate, you know, romantic dinner time or something or a special vacation or whatever closeness, often they react to a really close time with their partner by distancing afterwards, because it's like really overwhelming to go that deep and intimate. If you understand that as the partner, you don't take it personally. Like, wait a minute, we were really close and we had this amazing sex or we had this amazing intimate conversation and now you disappear. If you understand that's not about you. That's the attachment system. You can say, oh, honey, I know you're kind of like missing in action for a while, but I just want you to know I'm still here when you're ready to come back. You know, you can, you can understand it without going into this big personal abandonment pain, you know, which is understandable that you would feel that. But if you understand, if we, that's what I want, why I want to get this information out, because a lot of what we're taking personally in our relationships, whether it's parenting or partnering is, is not about the kids or the partner. It's about the original attachment pattern. And if we can help a person move towards secure, that really helps. So the challenge for the avoidant is that in our relationship to an avoidant or for the avoidant themselves is to allow their attachment system to turn back on. And in the beginning, when they feel a longing to connect, that feels like the total wrong thing to do. Because for so many experiences as a little kid, it was something that was extremely painful. So when I have a client or a friend that's going into this longing to connect and they feel like it's the worst thing in the world, I say, you know what? That's your secure attachment showing up. We want to plant a flag in that. That's really great. And I know originally when you wanted to connect, it was horrible. It did not go well. But I want you to see if you can feel the nourishment in the relationship right now, because I'm here, I'm present. This may not, this may be completely 100% different than how it was for you as a kid, but your partner, if I'm doing couples counseling, your partner is actually here. They want to hear what you have to say. They're present. They're holding this compassionate container for you. And you have to help people baby step back into this sense of longing because it feels like everything they're defending against. So that's the kind of thing I'm trying to talk about with people to help them move towards secure attachment. I think it's absolutely critical. Uh, You know, when I I remember the first time I listened to your audio program, which which had much more of an impact on me than reading about these things. Because I, I have I like I know, like audio too. I yeah. Yeah. I've got Dan Brown's massive book on attachment theory and you know, it must be what, six hundred pages, but and I've studied a lot of Dan Siegel's work. But I think part of it for me was just that your energy and your presence on the audio is is quite nurturing and and i felt uh, just the sound of your voice was heart opening to me but one of the things that you said a minute ago um has turned out to be something that i use and i want to share it because i know uh, there's probably a lot of people out there like me that have uh, at least some, some degree of avoidant in them and you know when i I'm a, I'm a lone ranger type. Even when I was a paratrooper in the military and and doing you know hardcore soldiering work, wow. I was always I was always Thank the you pathfinder. For that contribution. Oh well, that's big. Knowing what knowing what I know about how the military actually works, I mean, I appreciate your comment, but unfortunately, the military is not used to protect the country. It's used to steal resources from other countries for rich yeah, people. Yeah, that which, part that part is definitely egregious. I know, awful. Yeah, that's why I got out when I realized what I was really being used for. I said, "That's enough of this. I'm not going to contribute to that." But my point being is that. I've always been a lone ranger type for, I got out of team sports cause I kept getting irritated that guys playing football or hockey would just drag ass and we would lose. And I'm like, why are you not putting out? Why are you not contributing? So that led me into boxing and kickboxing and in motocross. I was very successful in motocross 
because it was me and the motorcycle, even though there was other guys there, it was really a race against myself every time. Could I make each lap a little faster? But what I found, you know, in my own life, particularly having two wives and two little kids, is I found that if before I go engage my family or even people uh, uh, at all, if I clean up what I'm doing and bring it to a closure. So for example, in my office, I, my office is in a beautiful house right next to our main house. So at night before I go engage the kids and the girls, I go through a routine where I wash all the dishes, clean out my incense trays, and just get my office so that when I'm leaving, it feels real clean and orderly. And it gives me a chance to sort of disengage from my work and just kind of have a, a dishwashing meditation. And then I just sort of gather myself and then I say, okay, now I'm ready to go be with, with everybody. But prior to having that, that routine where I sort of centered myself and brought what I was working on and thinking about to closure, it was almost as though I was still in my work world or in my inner process. And then I would go engage them, but inevitably they would sense that I wasn't there. And so that would lead to stress. So I think for people that are avoidance that can relate to what I'm saying, having a ritual of your own that brings you to closure and then opens the 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 door to the next experience. I found that personally to be helpful. That transition time is crucial, actually. You're saying something that's really, really important. Once you get through, I'm not going to ask you this question right now because this question is going to pertain to all three of the insecure attachments, but I do have a question that I'd really like to ask based on a lot of modern research uh, in this area. So uh, feel free to move forward. I'm I'm really enjoying it, and I'm sure everyone listening is probably getting a hell of an eye-opening experience. <laughs> I want to say a little bit more about your um, transition ritual to help people understand why that's so important for the avoidant. If you think about an avoidant in their job focus, they're extremely focused, which is a wonderful capacity to have. But it's a little bit like going scuba diving. They're going very deep into their psychological space into the project. And they're very, 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 very focused, which is why they can be so productive and do such a great job, really. They're incredible. Um, when they want to shift to something that's more attachment related, like relationship, it's like they have to have the time. I don't know if you've ever scuba dive, but you have to have the time to come up. Otherwise, you kind of get the bends, you know? So yeah, you want to you like, yourself. <laughs> exactly. You want to gradually shift from that work focus and self-focus um, and take the time it takes. And your partner needs to know to give you that. Like if you didn't come up with that ritual themselves, yourself, your partner, might, your partners might need to say something like, you know what? I want to take the family out to your favorite restaurant to celebrate our anniversaries or to celebrate your birthday or whatever. And it's your favorite restaurant and everything. And it's a very thoughtful thing, but they need to say something like, and I know you probably need 20 minutes or 30 minutes to shift, you know, that will not have the avoidant giving it a brusque route. We're actually like, I am in the middle of something. Leave me alone. You know, which is kind of the feeling it's going to be because if they're deep in the, in the scuba diving, that, that interruption feels like a really big deal because it, it changes their focus. So a partner needs to know, Hey, we have this wonderful family event happening. Um, how much time do you need, sweetheart, to uh, wrap up what you're focused on right now? Instead of going, hey, it's, you know, you were supposed to be leaving five minutes ago. You got to go. That's not going to work for an avoidant. They need that time to go from scuba diving up to the surface and to shift to allow their attachment system to turn on and to have that intention and then to be in a more relationship focus. And that is not about them. This is what thing happens in couples all the time. That is not rejection. It feels like rejection if they're brusque, but it's really because they needed the transition time and they didn't get it. And then they tend to be a little bit snarky. So it it's if you understand that you're not constantly feeling hurt because somebody you know, acted like you were interrupting them when you were trying to give them the best thing in the world. You know, it's, 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 it's understanding how these things work and, and, uh, compassionately. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It does. And I, uh, what came to my mind that I wanted to add to that is I studied the work, I believe it's Alan Peace. It's been about 15 years 
but he did a lot of research into the differences between men and women. And he showed that on average, a man emits about 10 to 12,000 words a day, and a woman emits between 22 and 24,000 words a day. So as he says in his teachings, he says, by the time a man comes home from work, all he wants to do is stare at the fire and grunt. Right. But a woman, the word quota woman, is up. <laughs> yeah. And a woman wants to tell you about everything that happened in her whole day. And she often feels like her man's disinterested or avoidant. But really, it's just a difference in the nature of the psychological structure in males and females. And I find that Along with my ritual, if I'm out of words because I deal with people's problems all day, I'm you know I'm a, a I'm an expensive therapist that is hired by people in big trouble, and I I sit and coach people all day and do therapy and work on people's bodies or whatever and do a lot of deep mental work. So one of the things that helped me is I many years ago I bought myself a really good massage chair, and so sometimes. Because I know I've got two wives and I've got a little girl and I know, okay, I'm about to go into a word storm. So I found <laughs> that if, I, if I'm not ready for a lot of words, I just put on my massage chair and, lay, you know, and just lay in the chair for 10 or 15 minutes or whatever it takes. Sometimes it's only five and I just go into silence. I just let my mind completely relax and my body completely relax and sort of like reboot my computer. And I don't get out of the chair until I'm ready for the words. Now, Smart. fortunately, Penny, Penny's actually quite masculine in her communication style. And she doesn't even like being around women a lot because she says they just talk about a lot of nothing. She'd rather talk to men. Um, but Angie's much more expression. Uh, uh, she, she connects through words. So I found that if I just give myself anywhere from five to 12 or 15 minutes to just be quiet, and be still and not have to engage even my own thoughts that I can go home and I can be a better husband and a better father because that's what I need to deal with a lot more words. Very smart self-regulation. Great idea. Great idea. I love Symbiotica's products. As you all know, I share them as often as I can because they work and they're made of the best quality resources you can get. And Symbiotica has just come out with a new liposomal activated charcoal that has many amazing benefits. Sherveen, let us know what is the power, the potency, and the use of liposomal activated charcoal. Paul, this was an exciting one for us because, as you know, we're from the islands of Hawaii, and charcoal is really big over there in terms of detoxification. We make ours using coconuts. And this product's the first time it's ever been in a liposomal form meaning it's protected to make it all the way down into the gastrointestinal area. And then it's really starts taking on its action. Anyone that's got anything dealing with candida overgrowth, exposures to mold, radiation, pesticides, pharmaceutical residues, an overly acidic body, this is a very quick, easy way to provide a rapid solution to any of those issues. If you're dealing with bloating, anything like that, the way charcoal works, it's not an absorber that most people think. It's an adsorber. It's an electrical charge. So it pulls in anything that does not belong in the body into the charcoal and then evacuates and eliminates out. This is one of our top sellers. The reviews on it are incredible. I can't wait for anyone who hasn't used it to try it and just let us know their feedback. Exciting. So if you want to get your liposomal activated charcoal, go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. That's symbiotica.com. And on checkout, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 to get your 15% discount. And while you're there, check out all the amazing Symbiotica products because your discount applies across the board. Enjoy. Does it feel like a good time for me to talk a little bit about ambivalent attachment? I am ready for you, baby. Hit me. Okay. Okay. Ambivalent attachment is a different adaptation to um, a parent or a situation where things weren't uh, as secure. And usually what's happening, again, we're just fo focusing on parenting styles. Parents, for whatever reason, were somewhat in inconsistent or unpredictable. Um, they had a parenting style that was kind of here today, gone tomorrow, on again, off again. So consistency, if you think of it in psychological terms, it might be intermittent reward, right, is what 
creates obsession or sometimes addiction. So when when you don't know if your parent, like one time they're going to be loving and the next time they kind of drop you in terms of connection, they get distracted or they're preoccupied by something else or their own attachment injuries get triggered in the relationship and they're off and running internally the child's start going to start to really focus on the parent in a way that the parent's kind of a moving target in terms of being a source of love. So they f- they feel very anxious and they have a hard time self-soothing and they just don't know if they're going to be met with love or not. And that creates a lot of kind of like, she loves me, he loves me not kind of concern. And they have a big fear of being abandoned or betrayed or, um, you know, left. So there's a lot of stress when they're in a relationship on when the person's leaving, whether they're leaving for work or they're leaving on a business trip or they're leaving into the other room, they feel a stress. I had a ambivalently um, attached uh, colleague that talked to me about like they, she would have these really wonderful lovemaking sessions with her boyfriend, but then when he would roll over to go to sleep, she would immediately feel abandoned and distressed. And I mean, they just had all this wonderful contact, but she would feel just devastated that he rolled over to go to sleep. And, and, and intellectually she knew that wasn't, she wasn't being left, but her internal attachment system would go into this pain. So in ambivalent attachment, the attachment system is kind of on steroids. It's like over-functioning. It's over-focused on relationship and it it's highly emotional and there's a pressure to speak and it can feel like on the receiving end, you're getting a tsunami of words coming at you. And, um, and sometimes the way a story is told, there's so much detail or so many different tangents in it. You have a very hard time following where the heck it's going or what the resolution was. And they're taking you through all these little back alleys. And I, 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 it, it, it's challenging to figure out, well, what's the relevant point here? You know, you get lost in the story. And the opposite's true for avoidant because they use so few words, you have to kind of feel like you're pulling information out of them all the time because there's not enough information for you to really understand what's going on. So it's an interesting, usually these two get together. So they often press each other's buttons. I mean, they initially are attracted to the juiciness and avoidance attracted to the juiciness and the expressiveness and the emotional availability of the ambivalent. And then the ambivalent is is kind of like the fact that the avoidant is sort of self-sufficient and um, they can to have a little space for their own needs and things like that. But the the interaction between the two is an interesting dynamic. But I want to give you a feeling for the ambivalent first. So internally, they have their attachment system over-functioning. And they, here's the thing, an ambivalent is constantly searching people's faces or tone of voice or whatever to scan for slights, to scan for some disappointment, because they're just sure they're going to get dropped. And that is wired into uh, survival as well. It's because they were dropped enough as a kid that they have this overarching concern. So, but the thing is, they have a distortion they're very often not aware of. And that is that whenever they're reading somebody's faces, they're really good at reading emotional cues and avoidance are usually not so good at it. Um, They they tend to interpret it incorrectly. Like if somebody is busy and they don't smile at them, they think of that as a major rejection. They're always looking for slights. So, you know, they're like, you didn't smile long enough or you didn't hug them long enough. Or there's always this feeling like you don't love me. I'm not lovable. Um, the, you're disappointing me or I'm mad at you. I feel abandoned by you in the relationship. And so they do, it helps a lot to reassure them because it calms their overactive attachment system down and it helps them regulate emotionally. They tend to regulate externally. They feel like they can't regulate unless you are regulating them. So they put a lot of pressure on their therapist or their partner or their teacher or their person, their friend to regulate them when actually they do need to help themselves and everybody else by learning how to self-soothe and self-regulate. They need to learn how to give their partner space because they tend to uh, pressure a lot for caring behaviors. But here's the thing. They keep asking for caring behaviors, but they're ignoring the ones that are actually happening. And they don't know they're ignoring them. They're not doing this manipulatively or it can feel that way, but they're not being manipulative. They just don't see it. So that you have to help them notice caring behaviors. I had this 
client that was lovely. She'd been in my training and she wanted to do a session with me. And she started the session with, you know, um, I, I always pick these unavailable men and they're never around and they never, they never, you know, I just usually relationship last two years and I have to break up with them. And I want to break up with my current boyfriend because he's not available either. And I said, well, and I'm thinking in my head, okay, this is a classic ambivalent attachment thing, but I'm not making that judgment. I'm just asking her questions about her history and about her previous relationships a little bit. And so then I said to her, well, you've been with this guy for two years or anything he does that's um, kind or, you know, it shows he's interested in the relationship. Oh, no, no, no. He doesn't do anything. And I'm like, wait a minute, before you knee jerk answer that, I really want you to sit for a minute and think about, I'm sure over the last two years, he's done something kind. And she's like, kind of mad at me, kind of scoffing. And, oh, no, he doesn't do anything. I'm like, just hang in there. And she goes, well, he travels a lot for business. Why he's never here, never here when I need him. I'm like, okay. Because they always tend to tilt things towards the negative. It's because they have dealt with early on in their relationship blueprint, a lot of being, they never were able to relax into the certainty that the relationship was really there for them. So it keeps them in a highly activated, anxious state, which is uncomfortable. And then they get angry. They can either get really disappointed and sad. If they have a lot of ambivalent, they go to anger and they can get very, very, they can pick a fight and nobody even did anything, but in their mind, they deserve it. So um, anyway, she said, well, he calls me every night to see how my day was. And I'm like, well, that's kind of nice, you know? And she goes, yeah. And I said, well, anything else? And she's like, kind of irritated. Well, let me think. Um, well, he does bring me back really nice gifts and he must know something about me because there are always things I really like. I said, well, that's really sweet. And I, and I said, so I, we went on and on. And eventually she was telling me they, they would go on special trips because he was gone so much. He would take her for four day weekends. I mean, there were like four or five different really major things he was doing correctly. I'm sure he had other things he wasn't doing correctly, but they were, and she was shocked at these caring behaviors because she literally dismissed all of them. She did not see them. So this is something you have to understand about the ambivalent. They have this internal experience of not seeing love when it's actually there. And then they get angry and upset and, and they, they feel like it's always the other person that's not doing the right thing. So here's one way I got her to understand the implicit memory part of this. I said, I want you to imagine there's this huge table full of wonderful loving behaviors, whatever it is you want, whatever it is material or or emotionally or whatever it is you want in a relationship. And then I want you to just see if you can take it in. And she goes, oh, that sounds good. So she's like creating this buffet of all these wonderful behaviors. And as soon as I asked her to take it in, her entire stomach and diaphragm constrict. And she goes, oh, I, my, my body just constricted. I said, yeah. I said, that's interesting because here's all this love you've been wanting and hammering people for, but your body's actually constricting because you have to own your own attachment style and you have to feel it in your body because it's unconscious to you as, as it is. And that's why it plays out so much. So I said, let's just, let's change the challenge. Let's just see if you can take 1% of that loving stuff that's piled on the table. And as soon as I did that, she goes, oh yeah, my stomach relaxes. I can take that in. And then eventually she wanted 5%, 10%, you know, whatever, which is great. But they have to practice staying present for receiving caring behaviors. And they're really focused on asking for them and sometimes demanding them and sometimes picking fights around not having them. Um, but it really helps if they start to realize that part of the problem is they don't have a good receiver usually in their physiology. And so even if they have all the love around them in the world, and of course, it's never that good, um, they tend to repel it. And they don't know they're repelling it. So they're constantly in a state of dissatisfaction and lack of fulfillment. And so she started to feel like, oh, I'm feeling satisfied. I'm starting to feel fulfilled. And I said, yeah, that's the state that wasn't able to stabilize when you were little with your parents for whatever reason. And now it's something you have to practice staying present in your body when there's compliments or there's gifts or there's, there's, um, somebody being loving, you have to like scan for it, pay attention to it and see if you can actually receive as much as you're able to receive. And once they start practicing that, they, they're on their way back to secure attachment. But what they don't know they're doing, and it's not that they're trying to be manipulative or that they're, you know, they're not a good person or something. They're, they're just unaware. They're tilted towards the negative and they have a very hard time letting go of past hurts. They get, they, if you start to have an argument with them, they can say, Hey, in 1972, you did this. And in 1995, you did that. And that's not helpful. It, it doesn't lead to good resolution usually, but they have a very hard time being 
present focused and future focused. Avoidance are not past. They ignore the past. They just minimize all the crap they went through. They just think, oh yeah, it was good enough. Who cares? It's, I'm moving forward. They don't really allow themselves time to heal because they won't focus on really allowing the past to surface and move through it. Um, ambivalence have the opposite problem. They are stuck in the past. They don't make a distinction in their language when they're telling a story. Sometimes you can't tell if they're talking about the past or the present because of the way they use tenses and the way they use gender when they're talking. And uh, that's because your language patterns are laid down at the same time as your attachment patterns. So avoidance tend to not have very many words because nobody was there. They were dealing with neglect or sometimes extreme abuse if it crosses over and disorganized a little bit. And they don't develop an emotional awareness or a vocabulary about emotional things. They have to work at that later. And that's something we can help them with in therapy or in our relationships. But ambivalence have the opposite challenge. And it's so helpful if they actually understand what that challenge is and that they have practical things we can give them in therapy or in our relationships where we can practice these things that take Whichever attachment style we started out with, we can shift to secure attachments. Very hopeful message. It's such a strong possibility to regain some of these capacities if you're willing to be a little uncomfortable in the beginning. I was talking to an avoidant guy with his wife who was ambivalent, and I said, you kind of got to be willing to hug a porcupine when she's in her ambivalent thing because she's going to come at you with attack. And she's going to come at you with disappointment and she's going to come at you with all the things you don't do. And as an avoidant, there are some things you might not be doing. So you might want to see if you can lean in when everything in your body is telling you to move out. And that's uncomfortable. And I said, you're going to be uncomfortable for a while, but eventually as she calms down and she's more nourishing and she's actually loving the connection more, you're going to both have a win-win where she's enjoying the connection and you're actually enjoying the connection. And so it's, it's like we sort of have the challenge of doing some things we're uncomfortable with. Like the uncomfortable thing for the ambivalent is to give their partner space. Like, okay, honey, I know it's going to take you a little while to, you know, finish that project. Or, you know, I know you don't really have time to be with me until seven o'clock tonight or whatever. That's really hard for the ambivalent because they want it now. And, and, and then also not to come at you with complaining, but to actually learn how to be direct with their needs and realize that you don't have to be the source of all their needs, that they have a support system. They can go different places um, to get what they need, but that you also have some ability to meet a need as if you're avoidant, you know? So there's these just simple things when you understand attachment styles that we don't take things so personally. We don't get so wounded in our relationships. We have a lot more compassion and love to share. And it brings well being and meaning and connection and intimacy that's really there. Everybody has secure attachment underneath all the insecure wounding. It's just we get wounded in different ways and it gets wired into our survival system in different ways. Like for an ambivalent that's in their amb- their ambivalent pattern, to not talk feels like a threat to their survival. And if you're avoiding, it's so many words coming at you, you can't handle it. You know, so you're in your survival, like, oh, wait a minute, stop, you know. Um, and the other thing, you know, it, it, it's an interesting dynamic that both people need to understand. I've lived through all of these things. <laughs> yeah, well, they're so, relevant, aren't they? To most people listening, I imagine, too. Yeah. Uh, I had a question. Is the ambivalent um is it because that they were often um in the environment where the parents were unstable or not consistent in their ability to love and connect that leads them to having that grasping uh, or that negative react like you talked about the woman with all the love on the table uh but she then tightened up so my my sort of intuition was well maybe that in her life, love came with pain. So now she has an associ- a psychological association that with connection comes pain, be it because there's some kind of expectation or there's going to be the pain of disconnection. Yes. The, it, it's, it's, it's wired as a package deal. It's wired into their survival system in an unconscious way. So if I if I'm in a relationship and I, if I'm speaking as an ambivalent, if I let myself love or I let myself relax and receive love from that other person, then what I'm wired for is the next thing that's going to happen is they're going to drop me. They're going to abandon me. They're going to disappoint me. They're going to hurt me. They're going to 
have an affair, they're going to do whatever, right? They're going to do something that's really, really painful. And because of that, they don't allow themselves to receive the gift because right behind it, the gift of connection, the gift of whatever it is, right behind it in their wiring is the next thing that happens is they do some, they drop me somehow in a really painful way. So you have to help them receive because they, they block their receiving. They don't realize they're blocking their receiving because they're so hung up on asking for what they want and demanding what they want and pushing for what they want. They don't even stop doing that. Like I have a friend that, you know, she'll call up and she'll ask me, I need you, I need help with blah, 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 blah. Or can you give me some time to consult on this client or whatever? And I say, yes. I say, yes, that's great. And then they keep talking. I, I really it, it keep explaining why they need this. I said, I already said, yes, 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 I can do this. I can do it at three o'clock tomorrow. Yes. And they keep talking. It's like 20 minutes of convincing me when I've said yes in the first 10 seconds, because they don't hear, they can't allow, it's like the yes just falls off them. And I said, you know, I've already said yes, like 10 times. Let's just talk tomorrow at three and I'll do whatever you want me to do. You know? And, it, and I, I always get off the phone thinking oh, that's, that's that I understand it, but it's like, oh my God, you know, so a lot of wasted energy really, but you know, it's, it's what happens because it's programmed that way. And that's why besides helping them notice caring behaviors, you sometimes have to reassure them. You're like, you know, and you have to stay tethered. Like, okay, I'm on a business trip. Nobody's doing too much of that right now, but um, hey, I, I'm at the airport. I'm getting on the plane. I'll be landing. At, if it's on time, about five o'clock, I'll check in with you at five o'clock. You'd need to, to stay tethered in a way until their attachment system relaxes enough that they trust you. Might take a while. Then they don't need all this reassurance. It's not like you have to do it forever. You just have to do it till the relationship moves close enough to secure that everybody can relax on the comings and goings, the natural, you know, being alone and being connected rhythm that is normal and secure attachment has to become stronger, but that takes some time to work out. The avoidant needs to show up more and the ambivalent needs to back off a little bit and also receive what's actually there and, and not be recapitulating all the negative abandoned wounds from their childhood and from previous relationships and maybe their previous relationship with you, all of that gets really magnified. But they need help to learn how do I ask for my needs in a direct way when it doesn't come out as an attack. Like you never do the dishes or you never help with the kids' homework. That, you know, usually the a person on the receiving end of that is going to be like, oh, you know, not feeling very appreciated. Thank you. You know, it's, it, you, you well, can also, ask a different it way. Kill, to, it kill, it, it's, yeah, it kills the intimacy. But it, well, it kills your sex drive too. Well, yeah, because I mean, really all conversations and all actions are foreplay in a way, you know? So if you move to secure attachment, it usually moves you better into connecting physically, sexually as well. I tell men particularly that complain because they're not getting enough sex. I say, well, remember foreplay begins as soon as you wake up. <laughs> yeah. How you treat your partner. Right. Very, very true. couple things come to my mind. I think it might've been in your program uh, somewhere where I was studying attachment styles and it might have been your program you'll certainly tell me quickly was there a story in your program about a doctor or a lawyer whose wife kept calling him incessantly at work all the time and he, yes i remember that it was a great description there's an, another thing i i wanted to ask you you know a lot of the love that people get unfortunately is really what is commonly referred to or what i refer to in my model of as conditional love, which is I love you if and or but. So I love you if you take the garbage out. I love you and you have to do this. I love you, but you didn't do that. So now I'm not loving you. It seems to me that that kind of love could easily create that ambivalent kind of attachment in a child or in, in anybody. Because your, your love's always contingent upon meeting some external objective. Yes, that conditional pieces, not just appreciating the child or the person who's just their essence, the essence of their authentic self, you know, they don't have to do anything, they don't have to deserve it, they don't have to be any particular way, that's just who they are. That's, that's definitely lives in the camp of secure attachment, really being able to have that kind of connection. Yeah. And you can think of all the insecure attachments as moving away from that in some way. But it's also a narcissistic perspective, you know, um, the, this you were asking about statistics. The statistics in our culture from um, narcissism are going up, and the statistics for empathy and compassion are going down. 
And ideally, we figure out a way to switch that around because that that doesn't lead us to a good place. <laughs> that's that's an unfortunate direction. And I think part of that might be uh, related to so much use of social media and devices instead of face to face contact. And I mean, the pandemic's another unusual problem to throw in the mix. But um, you know, we kind of moved in parenting towards. Uh, sometimes an overinflation of um, self-esteem. Self-esteem is really important. We don't want to be like injuring people's self-esteem, but we don't want to overinflate self-esteem either. So there's a middle ground there where you're, you know, you're, you have humility and you have a sense of your own foibles. We all have foibles. We all have, you know, limitations. I mean, that's part of being human, but you're connected to your humanness enough that you're aware of, you know, where your strong suit is and where some of your limitations are. And that's normal. And you can self accept that. And other people can accept other people with some limitations. That's not a big deal. Uh, but to the, that helps reduce this idea of, um, grandiosity that sometimes, um, we can move to that doesn't help. <laughs> you know, it's not taking us to our most authentic self or our capacity to be intimate. And by narcissistic, I think you're orient. You mean uh, people that are overly oriented toward themselves. Yeah, and I mean we have to be self-oriented to some extent, but we're not self-oriented in a way that invalidates the needs of other people or uh, uh, the, what's greatest good for the group. You know, in some cultures, like the Zulus, for instance, they have a very strong uh, individualistic support. They they really believe in the power of the individual and the importance of the individual, but they equally equally believe in the importance of group and community and healing and group and and they have they have the capacity for both and. I think in, in the United States culture, we've, we, we, one of our gifts is that we're very individualistic, but one of our wounds is that we're very individualistic because sometimes we're not so great at community or we're not so great at really understanding the greater good. Like even this issue about wearing a mask, I mean, that, that even became an issue that there's a violation of my personal rights to not wear a mask. I mean, that we're in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, it, it, it's just a, example, whether you believe in masks or don't believe in masks, I mean, wearing a mask is not that big a deal if, if it could potentially help people from spreading this disease, you know? So just the fact that we had that as a cultural issue was it one of the examples of just, you know, I mean, you could say stopping at a red light is infringing on your freedom. I mean, but, you know, if we don't have traffic lights, we're going to have a lot more auto accidents, you know? So it's, it's just a practical thing. But this sort of idea that, you know, we have to understand like what's in the best interest of the group is as important as what's the most important thing for you, you know, and sometimes you have to give way to do what's for the greater good, you know, and, and, and in other cultures, I mean, I teach internationally, like in Denmark or Scandinavia, they're very uh, easily oriented to what they want personally, but then also what is for the greater good. And they're quick, they're culturally conditioned to give up their position if they feel like the, for the greater good or for is for the group. They all can move off their position if, if that's clear. And, um, you know, they, they do that processing really well, you know, working that out much, much better than anybody I've been around. I mean, I'm just more familiar with their culture, but it's interesting. Different cultures have different ease with these things. Yes. Well, yeah. let's see if we can get through the, the, uh, disorganized. And, and sure. if you have a few minutes left, maybe I'll hit you with one more question and we'll find a close. Okay, so with disorganized, the difference about disorganized or disoriented or sometimes called type D attachment adaptation is that a child encountered a parent or both parents or family environment that had too much threat. So the attachment system, the drive to bond and connect to this parent uh, is blocked by the instinctive drive to stay safe because the parent is either is doing abusive things, uh, sexually, emotionally, or physically. They're hitting or yelling. Um, they're dysregulated in a major way. And sometimes this can happen even if the parent is not doing anything obvious, uh, like those kinds of things, hitting or striking or invading boundaries or things like that, but that they have so much unresolved trauma themselves that their energetic field is kind of electric. You know, it's, it's full of trauma energy and children cannot bond to that. And it's it, maybe the parent just hasn't had the opportunity to heal the trauma yet and or they don't know how to do it. But the result is, is the child will have an, a, a, the attachment system will be active instinctually and the threat response will also be active instinctually. So they'll 
like uh, you can see it in this strange uh, situation studies that you can check out on YouTube uh, where a child move like tar- the parent comes back after after leaving a child off with a with a social worker or a stranger and then they leave and then they come back and they're really studying doing research on the reunion how the child reacts to reunion a secure attached child just immediately feels great their parents back and they can invite them to play and they're no big deal an avoidant child will act like the parent's not even there because they ignore a relationship. But physiologically, if you hook them up to biofeedback, they're having all sorts of internal reactions to the parent being there that are stressful, but they don't cue. They don't have a gesture for connection because they've learned to turn their attachment system off, but they're highly stressed as they're turning it off. It takes a lot more energy to turn your attachment system off. So avoidance are actually very stressed, whether they're aware of it or not, because it's, it takes a lot to put the brakes on a very big natural part of yourself. So that's something to understand about avoidance and, um, ambivalent will come back and they'll cry and scream and complain and protest all the protest behaviors. And then the parent will pick them up and they won't, they can't sue. They just keep crying or screaming. And, uh, because they have a hard time calming their, the attachment system got so overactivated and also it was experienced as an abandonment or a betrayal. They're just super upset. So that would be what a, a researcher would call ambivalent. Now, when they get to the disorganized, kid will start running towards the parent. So the attachment system is on and then they'll stop in the middle, the midway, and they'll run around in circles or they'll fall to the floor or they'll, you know, just disconnect and look like a little zombie. Um, that shows that the, the threat response is, of dissociation or they're running towards, but then they might turn around and run away. Their flight response is on. Or I've even seen uh, videos where the kid goes up and hits their mother in the face. They punch him in the face or they slap him in the face. That's their fight response because they get this entanglement of the attachment system and the threat response at the same time. Now, you can have uh, people that show disorganized towards avoidant, like they have the threat response going on, but their adaptation besides this threat response takes them to run away or takes them to withdrawal. So that would be called disorganized avoidant. And you can also have disorganized ambivalent where their free, their ter- their, this fear response comes up and then they just are flooded with emotions and hysterical and, and uh, dysregulated emotionally or, or feeling very, very needy and clingy um, excessively. That would be, um, you could say, disorganized ambivalent. So disorganized can be a combination of both. They can have the extremes of avoidant and the extremes of ambivalent uh, back and forth when they're dealing with um, you know, the threat response coming on. This can be kind of sneaky because I had a a really lovely physician actually that I worked with, um, outside the country actually, but she was super mature, had done tons of personal work and she was getting married to this great guy that she really felt was literally very securely attached. Wonderful and wonderful man, very excited about the wedding, but they hit a certain level of intimacy and just this terror came up. And that's very confusing for them, but not so confusing if you have a little bit of disorganized attachment in your history that's unresolved. Because she, when she hit that tear, she came to me, we did a session, and we found out that it was related re- to her original relational blueprint where she had a mother who was, I think, struggling with a kind of a bipolar diagnosis. And she'd be very, very loving. And then she would do weird things like take everything out of this person's closet and throw it away or, you know, burn her stuff or do these kind of outrageously weird and kind of scary stuff. So this client, when we hit that, we were able to work with her about the threat response of the behavior of her mother. Um, we didn't, we never demonized the parent in the way I work. Um, just that they had this behavior that was very scary or very unsettling or very, very unusual or hurtful in the midst of they were also had the capacity to be loving at other times. So we put the negative behavior as far away from her as she needed it to be and brought in protectors around her other than her family and um, just other than at least her mother for sure. And then she was able to defend against that particular behavior of her mother that was upsetting. And she was able to run. She was running and, you know, saying certain words about her mother's unpredictability, uh, defending herself. And then that kind of ran through itself. And then she was, she actually, at the end of this, towards the end of the session, she invited her mother to be close to her. And she's, yeah, now it's okay for my mother to be close because I kind of dealt with this threatening behavior. So she calmed the, um, threat response. And then her attachment system was able to attach without, without the, um, the threat response taking over. And then we worked a little bit. So she, when she went home to her 
fiance, she was able to really take in his love and, you know, deepen the intimacy and not have this terror come up in the middle of it. So she was able to marry and, you know, all went in a good direction. I'm sure they have other challenges, but we got the, over the hump on that one. So those are some of the things that can happen with disorganized. There's a lot, you have to really emphasize feeling safe and real help, really help people regulate in the context of relationship. Um, and then, and then how they, they, uh, you know, different practices they can do depending if they tend to go disorganized avoidant or disorganized ambivalent that can help them uh, really be able to be present in the here and now in their relationships and feel intimacy and a sense of well-being. Yes. One of the things that I've come across many, many times in my studies, and I've spent a lot of time looking into it, is the formative forces in the womb, particularly of not only the mother's own internal psychic environment, but the relationship she's having with uh, her partner, be it husband or boyfriend, and the formative forces of the family. Uh, For example, if I've had many patients who are under a lot of stress because maybe they were Christian, but they were marrying somebody that was uh, Jewish or, or Muslim, and the family was going crazy because they didn't want that to happen. I had uh, I had a really severe case, a girl that was suicidal that hired me for help uh, a number of years ago in Australia. She was a, a professional model and she was raised a Muslim. And in her culture, they're not allowed to leave home until they're married. So she was mm. 28 years old, a professional model, but she fell in love with a Christian man and the parents just went absolutely apeshit and were just saying how you're going to ruin the family's reputation. You're we're going to be dis, disavowed in in our church and at our temple, and just put so much guilt and shame on her. But I'm curious if 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 the mother, like many women, as you know, get pregnant, but they didn't want to be pregnant, or or maybe it's a terrible time to be pregnant. So there's a sense of angst and and maybe even rejection of the child in the womb, it seems to me that that could set a child up for a disorganized attachment before it's even born. Uh, yeah, you your attachment system starts to get imprints. Remember, this is an unconscious process that goes into implicit memory. You really hold it in your body um, from the very, yes, definitely in the womb. I mean, there can be situations where a person's pregnant and their husband's beating them, you know, and even hitting their belly, you know, there can be all sorts of situations. Um, but you're, you're basically absorbing your whole mother's emotional environment, like what she's going through. You're even in absorbing her taste preferences. They've done research on that. You're basically downloading her brain into your developing brain. There's a lot of influence of, uh, in utero of what your, what's happening in all levels, uh, before we're actually out in the world after being, uh, you know, through a birth process and born. So all of that is deep, deep, deep imprinting. I had one uh, client I worked with that was in utero at six months. Uh, his mother, who was very connected to her mother, uh, her, her mother or his grandmother passed away and the mother went into a deep, deep grief process and um, and then just kind of disconnected from the pregnancy because she was so overcome by the grief of losing her mother. Which everybody can understand that, right? And so when we were working, uh, when he was born, he was born at a six-month-year-old weight, even though he was not premature. He, he was nine months gestation, but he was born as if he was premature because apparently it affected him so much that he just basically stopped growing when she went into this sort of traumatic shock of grief by losing her mother. And so in the session, we, we worked with, where we worked with it, actually, uh, we worked with him a little bit, but then we worked with his mother having the support she needed around grieving her mother, losing her mother. And, and his, he was feeling the grief of losing his grandmother because they basically passed. I mean, she left the body and he was just coming into his body and they missed each other by, you know, three months. And, um, so as, as the mother was really able to process her own grief in our imaginary way in the session, he was feeling his mother was getting all the support from, you know, her, her community, her religion, her husband, her friends, she's getting all the support to feel the grief and the grief got handled. I mean, she was never really hundred percent over necessarily, but she moved through her grief and had all the support. Then he started to feel the grief of losing his grandmother. And then he, he just like with this shock on his face, he went, Oh my God, 
I now can feel how much my mother absolutely loved me. Oh my gosh, she absolutely loved me. But all that experience of her love was blocked by this unresolved grief on the mother's level and on his level. And as they went through that, he just said, oh my God, I just, it's so important. And he had just had a little baby himself. He was in a, you know, married and had a new little baby. And he just felt all this capacity return to how he could love that baby because he had found this true embodied real life, spiritual and physical and emotional experience of the deep love his mother had for him, but he hadn't been feeling it because of this blocked issue. So it's like, you're working on all these levels because we were working with him as a fetus. I mean, he was a six month in the womb when this uh, traumatic grief happened for his mom and the effect of that. So I don't know if that kind of is in the same territory, but you were talking about. Yeah. Which brings up a thought uh, and a question. I've studied Mark Lu- Wu Lin's work. Are you familiar oh, with I that? I love him. He's one of my favorite people. I'm teaching intergenerational trauma next month. And that's a, a big part. Mark, I've talked to Mark several times. I, he's amazing. He's just an incredible guy. So once, once that book came out and I started using all of his questionnaires and, and practices, I found pretty much most people had uh, moderate to significant uh, generational issues passing through. I was just curious as to how much of that can affect our attachment style. Well, attachment styles are hugely intergenerationally transmitted. Uh, I mean, because you get this imprint, your parents have their imprint from their parents, and then they do what they do with it. If they do anything with it to heal, that's helpful. But if they don't, sometimes they get better or sometimes they get worse, depending on their circumstances. The, uh, attachment is a huge issue intergenerationally. So very, very important to think of it that way. And 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 really, I think what Mark says in his book, and I really agree with, is that reconciliation is really important part of the therapy process and life process. It's that like, okay, my parents came from certain backgrounds and they had certain challenges and they did some things really well and they did some things shockingly not so help- helpful, you know, in a really negative way, but that they probably did the best they could. And, and, and then as you resolve the traumas of what didn't go so well, it's like all the uh, loving in, uh, the loving connections start to be more available. It's almost like if you had a film strip, which I know is dating me now because nobody has film strips anymore, but if you, it's like that film strip of memory gets all just the to- totally the whole film strip gets sunk into the traumas and then you think of only negative things about your parents but then as you heal those traumas a lot of times that film strip straightens out again and you remember all these loving moments that you had with your parents and the love that they also may have had for you now some parents are pretty off and they don't show loving behavior or, at all or they're completely violent like you mentioned about your um second father but um you know, it, it is really helpful to work towards either, even if it's just self reconciliation with, okay, this is what happened. And I'm on a healing path about this and you're reconciled to that. But if there's, if there's any possibility of reconciling with actual parents, whether they're dead or alive, I think it really helps release the push of negative attachment injury to pass through the generations to the next generation. The more we recover, secure attachment, whatever, however we do it, uh, whatever therapy model we use or whatever religious practice we engage in or whatever relationship helps us heal it, um, it will free the uh, subsequent generations. Some people say that when you heal, you're healing a, a, even a particular wound that maybe the generations have carried. When you heal it yourself, you're actually healing seven generations back and seven generations forward. That's huge. And if we, it seems like in every family, there's one person that kind of takes on the, 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 the mission in a way to do a lot of healing work. I mean, some families, I have a friend that has all three of the siblings are doing healing work, but in like my family, I'm pretty much the the one that's mostly interested in that. Um, But you know, it, however many people are interested in healing, the better, you know, and, and uh, it, you are making a gigantic impact uh, of healing for yourself and for the ancestors that preceded you and the, the children or progeny or nieces and nephews that follow. So it's a, it's a big job sometimes, but it's got a huge benefit personally and in the whole lineage. Yeah. So for the listeners, Mark Wu Lin's book, if I remember right, Diane, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It didn't start with you. Yes. It didn't start with you. Yes. So another question I've been waiting patiently to ask is, 
I have a lot of experience working with plant medicines. I've conducted uh, approximately 400 healing ceremonies, and I've studied the research very extensively on the effects of uh, things like psilocybin and MDMA on healing. I'm wondering if you have any knowledge or experience with how psilocybin and MDMA can help. With I've these. heard I've heard people have some amazing experiences with that. It's not something that I've done personally uh, or worked with people that have done personally directly. So I don't have, I, I've heard great research anecdotes about it. And I have some friends that are working more directly with their clients in those programs. I think it's great to have therapy support when people move in that direction and also to take the smaller amounts or whatever the dosages need to be as to be carefully monitored. But um, I... I have not uh, had experience in that direction. Yeah, I have a lot of experience. But like you said, the one thing that I've found is if people are doing it on their own, they don't have a toolkit for working through because plant medicines break down the default mode network. So your unconscious just flows up into the conscious unabated. And the more trauma there is in there, the more challenging it is to uh, endure the experience of the ceremony or the journey. So what I've found is that a lot of people keep doing, you know, plant medicine after plant medicine after plant medicine, but they don't have the tools to do the integration work. So it's kind of like Groundhog Day. They just keep re-experiencing and re-experiencing and they feel oftentimes a big flood of love and connection and all of a sudden everything in nature is alive and they feel good. But within two weeks, they're right back to the same state that they were in. So uh, my my whole philosophy and what I encourage people to do is to the degree that you have indicators of unresolved trauma or deep relationship problems, which would link to attachment syndromes, that you should be doing this work in the hands of a skilled therapist or someone who really understands this process, or you're likely just to go through a hell of a lot of uh, mushrooms and MDMA and whatever else you're using. And um, there's negative effects to that as well, because when you unlock the default mode network, you're flooded with so much from the unconscious that many people um, can't handle what comes out of Pandora's box. And so you can actually come out of a ceremony like that feeling more uh, unstable and more shattered and often aware of traumas that you were unconscious of before, such as sexual abuse. So I've, uh, because I work in this area a lot and do a lot of soul recovery work, I've had people come to see me from all over the world that, you know, usually people between about 19 and 30 that get the idea from listening to podcasts and whatever, that all they got to do is do some ayahuasca and their whole world's going to be better. But oftentimes they're in group settings and they're getting overdosed for their own therapeutic threshold. So it really has the, the sort of the effect, I call it fracturing the psyche. When I look at them clairvoyantly, their energy field looks very scrambled, almost like a mirror that's been hit with a hammer. And so it can take sometimes a year to, to reintegrate people after one of those negative experiences. But I have also seen uh, tremendous results when people are properly managed and, there, and a lot of the research is suggesting that that... Um, psilocybin and MDMA, particularly because there's more research on that, can be very therapeutic in that regard. And fortunately, now they are setting up uh, centers around the world where that can be done effectively and legally. And I know um, in Amsterdam, they do a lot of that work because it's legal there. But that was sort of, a, I just was curious because that's really starting to be very in vogue right now. And and because of that, I'm seeing, as, as usual, I'm seeing... Um, a mix of a lot of positives coupled with a lot of negatives. And it's sort of like 50-50. It's a crapshoot. You're not sure what you're going to get unless you've been processed effectively by a therapist that knows what they're doing. Yeah, I think integration is the key. And I, I really, in my experience with deep trauma, things unfold as it's ready for to unfold. And if the therapist really knows how to guide it, um, that's, that's really important. Therapists need to understand how trauma works and that's a lot of training. And they also, I think, ideally understand, uh, the attachment work because so much of what's lost in extreme trauma is connection, connection to oneself, connection to the higher source, connection to the ground, connection to the planet, connection to other people. There's a lot of reconnecting to do, uh, with trauma. So 
it's but making sure whatever modality you're using is is pacing and dosing that high arousal in a way that's useful and also has the orientation to reconnect to vitality, life force, well-being. Uh, you don't have to go through every piece of the traumatic experience. There's so much you can do just to reconnect to people to their deep, authentic presence in the here and now. And that resolves a lot, but you don't ignore it either. You just don't have to do every single piece of it. You have to get it to where the nervous system re-regulates again and integration is possible. And then transformation yes. happens. You also have to start where you're capable of engaging. Um, in my experience, you know, you can, as a therapist with a skilled analysis, you can identify 10, 15, 20, 25 traumas, but a person may not be able to uh, they're not may not be equipped for some of the deeper stuff. So I always work carefully to start where a person's ready to engage. Finding the window that's open. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then they develop the, the the sort of the training wheels for for self management and self healing. Yeah, what a great interview and and great sharing. And uh, I have a lot of questions we didn't get to. So maybe if you're up to it in the future, we can do a part two. Is there anything you'd like to offer or suggest before we say goodbye? Oh, uh, just, just, I, I, I mean, I'm biased, of course, because I really believe in attachment, but I think attachment is a, understanding attachment helps you take things less personally, have more joy in your relationships, have more love in your life. And I think we all deserve that. So my vote is that whatever helps you move in that direction could be really, really helpful. If, if taking an attachment quiz helps you understand a little bit your own personal thing, again, you can check out our free attachment quiz on our website, dianefullheller.com or I, uh, Paul, you seem to like the audio tapes. And, oh, um, it was fantastic. Just, there's, there's I was just going to mention that. Yeah, it's fantastic. You did a great job, and uh, Sounds True is a great company to work with. So I highly recommend everybody, uh, if any of this touches you and you find yourself in it, uh, Healing Your Attachment Wounds, the audio CD program by Diane Poolheller who we've just enjoyed a couple of hours with from Sounds True, is priceless. I really like I said, having studied a lot of the stuff, even though your program's fairly basic compared to the depth that I've studied, I actually found it, it helped me integrate a lot of the more technical stuff because of the way you presented it. So I highly recommend it. And I want to say personally, thank you, Diane, for that beautiful gift you gave the world. Oh, well, you're so welcome. And thank you for the wonderful contribution you're making with your work as well. Thank you. And lots of love. And um when you feel up to it, let me know. Let's get through the rest of those questions and do a part two. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Paul. It's been a delight to be with you and everybody that's listening. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. Thank you for anything you buy from the sponsors. It supports the podcast and supports the world, as you always hear me say, because their values are aligned with mine, which I hope are aligned with yours. The world needs our love. So supporting organic food producers and organic farmers and uh, sustainable practices is where we need to go right away and uh, share this podcast with anybody that uh, sounds like you know they could use it because we all need a little uh, awareness of what a secure attachment is. And for those of you with secure attachments, I hope this program gave you some tools for supporting the people with insecure attachments in your life. So look forward to something very exciting with you next. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Diane Poolheller, PhD. Connect with Diane on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash somatic trainings. You can visit Diane's website at dianepoolheller.com and take the attachment quiz for yourself. And to learn more, you can get access to a five-part video series on attachment by texting your number to 720-548-2229. That's a USA number, 720-548-2229. Diane is also offering Paul's listeners $50 off the early bird pricing for both Dare One Live Online January 22 to 24, 2021 and or Dare Two Live Online March 12th to 14th, 2021. Use the code CHECK50 at checkout. That's capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, five, zero. For full details about the trainings, visit Diane Pool 
dianepaulepohle.com. That's D-I-A-N-E-P-O-O-L-E-H-E-L-L-E-R.com. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash Living4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and the Czech Institute's new media site, chikiva.com. Please don't forget to go to checkinstitute.com forward slash survey to take our survey and be entered into the drawing to win a bundle of our sponsor products and to help support our podcast. The survey begins today and ends on the 10th of January, 2021.